Hello, and welcome to today's Progressive Grocer webcast series presentation, the 2014 Consumer Value Study and how it affects your promotion optimization strategy. My name is Jim Dudlasek, and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Progressive Grocer, published by Stagnito Business Information. I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you very much for joining this webcast, which is produced by POI and sponsored by the TABS Group. We'll get started in a few moments. While we wait for the others to join us, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. The materials in this webcast have been reviewed by our editorial staff. However, the views of the speakers and their organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Progressive Grocer or its publisher, Stagnito Business Information. I want to briefly summarize some of the webcast features. First, if you have any technical difficulties, you can click the Help button on the lower right side of your screen to view the Event Help Guide. If you're having any problems, try pressing the F5 key to refresh your browser. This often clears up any issues. Additionally, you can submit questions to our speakers using the question comment box on the bottom of your screen. Just type in your question and hit the Submit Question button. We encourage you to submit your question at any time before the Q&A break starts, so please submit those questions early and often. We probably won't be able to answer all of your questions submitted today, but we'll try to answer them as many of them as we can. At the end of the event, we'll have a webcast evaluation survey, so please turn off your pop-up blocker now. We encourage you to provide feedback using this feature. Now, on to today's presentation. Our speakers today are Michael Cantor, CEO and founder of Promotion Optimization Institute, LLC, and Dr. Kurt Jetta, founder of the TABS Group. Michael Cantor has spent his career creating retail and brand price promotion optimization programs that drive improved loyalty and profits. Mike co-chaired and developed with Gartner Incorporated and leading CPG executives the industry's first standard set of trade promotion definitions and metrics, and pioneered efforts to define and document trade promotion management in food service. He began his career in retail advertising and operations as Senior Vice President for Drug World Pharmacies. Mike has written for numerous industry publications, Primary Research, Redesign the NYC Hospice Delivery Model, and speaks at industry events. Dr. Kurt Jetta founded the TABS Group in 1998 with the mission of delivering analytical innovations that simplify and improve the way business analysis is conducted in the consumer products industry. This vision continues to build traction in the industry as the company has grown revenue by double digits every year since its inception. A frequent contributor to Progressive Grocer and other industry journals, Dr. Jetta has made appearances on and been quoted in national media outlets such as CNBC, The Today Show, The New York Post, and Forbes. He's the author of the TABS Group Annual Vitamin Study. Prior to TABS Group, he was CEO of baby feeding supplier Binky Griptite, and he held a variety of marketing and trade marketing positions at Playtex Products. Now we're ready to begin. We'll start things off with Michael Cantor, so take it away, Mike. Thank you, Jim. And welcome to the over 250 attendees of today's webinar. I want to thank you personally for spending time with us today to take a bold look at our changing industry, review publicly stated industry sentiment, and examine current research to learn why is the overall CPG market so soft, how much of a role do promotions have in this weakness, and what you can do about it. Now I'll get to this slide in front of you, but first, several of you are new to the Promotion Optimization Institute. Many more we will see in just a few short weeks at the upcoming POI Fall Collaborative Promotion Optimization and Continuous Improvement Summit. Continuous improvement is at the core of promotion optimization. I believe thriving in today's retail environment requires that trading partners place less importance on the buzz of drones and the rise of millennials, and place greater focus on identifying and serving their best, most profitable customers today. As competition continues to threaten from every direction, the need to get assortments and today's subject of deals right within and across channels requires evolving strategies and tactics that break from the status quo. It requires doing something, not doing nothing. Now, about this slide. Earlier this year, the Promotion Optimization Institute with Gartner surveyed retailers and CPG manufacturers to better understand their progress with processes, skills, and tools. Some of the greatest and most respected brands and banners in our industry 
struggle at times to figure out price and promotion. Here's the good news. Today, as we can see, versus just five years ago, optimization and predictive capabilities are being implemented and utilized across internal and external teams with greater consistency by over 25% of you, and that number is growing. So getting from here to there, I mentioned POI's members are moving along the collaborative promotion optimization maturity curve. They're moving from management to promotion effectiveness to collaboration and optimization. We're seeing it across the industry on both the manufacturer and retailer side. We see it at our events. It's evident through our research. At the top of this curve is where manufacturers and retailers have committed their organizations to consistently contribute to the mutual profitability of the trading partner relationship. They share success in serving mutual shoppers and consumers. So how do we get there? As a trade association, POI serves our CPG and retailer members through research, as we're doing today, leading practice summits, and breakthrough education and certification in collaborative marketing. I ask you to join us in being bold as leading change requires new approaches to intra and inter-organizational collaboration. We're excited about the fact that we've taken action with our board and the industry to create the steps. Certified collaborative marketer candidates, as well as the graduates, learn collaborative price promotion optimization strategies and how to collaborate. Now, today's subject matter. And understanding your best shopper is a critical aspect of promotion optimization. The following research presented by Dr. Kurt Jetter, founder of the TABS Group, identifies trends, raises some key issues, and offers some alternative approaches and recommendations. Stick with us. At the end of this webinar, manufacturer and retailer attendees will have a unique opportunity to learn more about collaborative promotion optimization, effectiveness, all the way through, with a complimentary pass to the Fall POI Summit. Kurt, take us through the research and findings that are bound to be imp incredibly impressive. Well, thank you, Michael, um, and thank you, everyone, for attending, particularly those that have uh, sat in on prior TABS Group webinar. As you know, this is a somewhat different format, but it's a perfect format for the content. Um, Progressive Grocer, obviously a leading voice in the foods and beverage industry, and then POI, which is really the only clearinghouse in the industry for thought leadership and new ideas in trade promotion. And what we'll see is that there really is, through this data, a call to action and a kind of maybe a call to think about deals and promotions somewhat differently. So let me take you through the research a little bit. Um, so this is, at which is standard to all of our research that we field, uh, 1,000 adults, 18 to 75, through TNS, which is an internationally uh, reputable research firm. It's online uh, delivery. We fielded this identical research exactly one year ago, so August 2013 and 2014, and by keeping the survey consistent, keeping the timing consistent, we enhanced the trendability of the data. And there are three main areas of questioning that we ask. First of all, just what products and categories are they uh, purchasing and how often in consumables? And so this is purely consumables, but this is all the high-velocity stuff that you would think of water and candy and carbev and ice cream and juice, et cetera. So there's 15 specific categories that we asked about. We also asked about their... Uh, use of deals, and we phrased it as, do you agree strongly with you participating in this activity? For example, I uh, 
regularly clip coupons in the Sunday paper. And that was strong agreement. So think about it from a top box. So that's the top box, which in research is usually the most explanatory um, variable when you get feedback from consumers. And then finally, we asked about where do they actually purchase consumables regularly. And we defined regularly as at least six times per year. Now, we didn't ask um, per category. That would have just made the uh, research too long and unwieldy. And then also, we didn't have specific retailer breaks for grocery, which tends to slightly, and not as much you would think, as you would think, but does somewhat understate the incidence of grocery purchase. But we do have Walmart, Costco, Sam's, uh, some of the other major chains in the other channels. And when we get this data, and if those of you have sat in on other uh, presentations have heard me say, if your data from research, from surveys, doesn't corroborate other information that you know to be true, then it's useless. Don't use it. And so we conduct quite a bit of internal and external validation. So internally, if there's something particularly that looks odd or uh, there's a jump in a trend, we will cross-tab that and cross-reference that across multiple variables within the data. And then externally, we'll benchmark uh, some of the major conclusions against data you might find in, say, Nielsen or IRI, or we'll Google it. And you'll see several instances of that. And really, I'm, I uh, never cease to be amazed at how much consistency there is in this type of research as you uh, execute it year to year. Uh, we've done vitamin, the vitamin category specifically, for seven years, and there's more that's consistent over the years than is different. And so when you identify those differences, there's some real meaningful insights from that. So what's the background of this research? Well, first of all, we all are, I believe, aware that this is a very sluggish industry. Uh, it's, in fact, it's at historically low rates, at least for the, since I've been involved, and that's 20 years. So we're looking at national data from the U.S. Um, uh, Census and um, some of the other you know, Department of Commerce, et cetera, on growth in consumption. So you see the first two bars are overall consumption, and then we're using food and bev growth. Uh, you can see 4%, but in the most recent years, it's really dropped. And really what's interesting is that gap between overall consumption at 3.2 and food and bev consumption at 2.3 dropped. And then it's dropping even further um, in, in the AOC, which is all outlet channel. That's the um, channel being picked up by Nielsen and IRI. And then in even the most recent period, I saw something Nielsen posted that the growth is at 1.3%. So clearly very low. Uh, another big issue is trade promotion. So there's a real problem that's been identified by several of the leading CEOs in their latest uh, quarterly reporting. They're kind of laying the blame at um, uh, of their weak sales at, you know, and their uh, disappointing profitability on, hey, they're promoting all the time and, uh, you know, they, they really need to cut back. But really what we see, and this is really kind of a topic for a much longer discussion, and you can actually find it on webinars.tabsgroup.com where I talk about uh, there's two of them talking about uh, riskless profits and how trade promotion works into that and also loyalty card. I mean, here is just one prime example, Ho. There's just been this major shift by particularly the leading CPG manufacturers and retailers on promotional uh, execution. So you can see very nice list, very strong um, uh, up and through the first half, and then all of a sudden they just kind of switched tactics. They uh, offered less compelling deals. They offered what we call kitchen sink ads, where they're just throwing all their brands into an ad block and really not getting any lift or incremental sales at all. And here you're seeing that not only are no, you're not getting the incremental, but you're also seeing the baseline deteriorate as that's happening. And I think the conventional wisdom says, well, you're training them to buy on deal. You take away the deals, they'll buy more on 
non-promoted, and that's uh, not the case here, and it's really never the case from anything we see. And we call this the desert of despair. So, you know, a lot of companies have experienced this where this you can just see all of a sudden these incremental sales go down. And then also another interesting trend, and what's interesting is you just see so much written about it and tweeted about and Googled and blogged and just the whole millennials and targeting on them and how important they are, but you know, several uh, times uh, different pieces of research show, and in general, there's a softness in sales among millennials. And so let's take a look at what our research comes back as kind of the overall trend. So average purchases per category. So we're looking at the top. So you can see that uh, car, bev, and salty snacks to the left. So again, we're corroborating uh, with what we know to be true, the two highest velocity categories out there. And then also you see the corroboration as far as the trend. So all those major manufacturers in those areas have been complaining that the sales have been fairly soft. General Mills is the, one of the most recent. Yogurt with Greek yogurt, we know that it's, uh, that's gone up. Uh, and, th and this is annual purchases. So we're trying to corroborate with purchase frequency. But after you get all the pluses and the minuses by category, where this all nets out to is flat versus year ago. And again, we know this to be true from some of the, the uh, data that uh, we see published on it's on a flat unit sales basis. It's flat dollars. It's up slightly because of pricing. So our research certainly corroborates that. And so let's take a look at now the trends by some of the key demographics. The three key ones that we're particularly interested in are age, households with kids, and income. And a few key things are really noteworthy. First thing that really jumps out, and you look at males versus females, female at the top in orange, males at the bottom, the consistency in trend, males to females year to year, and then this divergence in trend here. So female millennials, 18 to 34, they're purchasing down, in fact, 14%. Males up slightly, up 6%. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then the other thing that's um, very important to note, and it's always been important, is that households with kids, by far the most important segment within the consumer packaged goods universe, and we tend to forget that. We don't really see a whole lot written by, about kind of the mainstream households with kids, large households, five-plus kids. Those are the ones accounting for the majority of dollars and purchases, uh, or I should say a disproportionate amount of dollars and purchases. But let's talk about that whole millennial trend, first of all. And here's the, as we kind of dive, dive into the specific categories, you can see out of the 15 categories, significant declines in 14. Now, as I said, we did, and conducted a lot of internal validation because this one just, you know, begged to be validated. And let's really kick the tires hard on the data to make sure we didn't have a sampling error or something. So sample size was sufficient as we looked at it by region, by, um, by specific age, say 18 to 24, et cetera, by income. They all were very consistent year over year. So this is a net decline of 14%. And this is really actually fairly consistent with some of the macro and demographic trends we see. One of the things that's been written about, you kind of Google it and you see that kind of the key macro trends, and this is a, a more applicable to both you know, both genders, men and women, but you see they're getting married later and living in the house longer. But now specific to women, and this is from eDigital, um, and, and I've seen it in a couple others, that women, younger women embrace technologies and smartphone technologies uh, more than men. So this was the break men versus women in 2010. You can see now in 2013 women more than men with the smartphone penetration. And as I mentioned, that is true for um, tech in general. So what we see with millennials, millennial women, is a, what appears to be a substitution effect. So all that money used for to sell 10 million iPhone 6s in three days or whatever, all of that had to come from somewhere. And so we kind of see this macro shifting in CPG consumables into some of the, the tech. I mean, there could also be the kind of the healthy living trend, the health and the wellness trend and better eating. All of those things could play into that as well. 
So now let's shift to looking at specific deals because this is, in fact, a consumer uh, value study and how do consumers react to deals. And so what we're looking at it is the top. So we asked about 10 different deal tactics, and we'll review those specifically on the next slide. But uh, of those that voice strong agreement at each one, so this is the distribution curve. So. Um, you can see that at the lower end, those using zero or one, actually it's a higher reported disuse or lack of use this year than last year. And then last year there were higher uh, percentage of people at the, you know, the real high end. I mean, the key thing to note here is that 92% of all people that we surveyed say they use at least one of the deal tactics regularly. So really everybody's a deal shopper. And then 42% of them are just really hardcore using at least five of the 10. I mean, that's a very high fundamental level of deal search activity because remember, we asked about not just agreement, but strong agreement. And so let's take a look at these tactics, and we kind of broke them down into four tiers based on level of magnitude. And again, here's that consistency year over year. You see they're very close, but tier one is EDLP. So that's kind of by far two-thirds of the people using EDLP, and that's usage of that is down slightly. Then there's this tier two, which is in the 40s, mid-40s, to 50s. Shopping for deals, so they work, go from retailer to retailer looking for deals, the good old Sunday circular, private label, and then FSIs. Uh, and then there's this third tier, which is loyalty cards, digital couponing, um, large sizes, and bonus packs. And then finally, kind of a distant, distant uh, uh, number 10 is rebates. Notice how eight of the 10 are down, and they're down between two and 10% as a high, but the only one that's of any size that's up is shopping for deals. So what we see happening, and it kind of I made this contention earlier, we're getting less compelling deals, and that was from prior tabs group research. And this is then manifested itself by people taking, participating in any individual deal tactic less. But rather than training them and weaning them off of deals, it's basically catalyzing greater deal search to get the deals that they were used to. At least directionally, that's what's occurring or appears to be occurring. Now, this is going to help us explain some of the outlet trends in a minute. Uh, if we break these deal tactics into two types, active and passive, when we talk active, we're talking things where uh, consumers actually have to do something to get the deal. They either have to utilize a rewards card, they have to cut a coupon, they have to look at the circular and search the circular. Passive is I just go to the shelf and I show up. So that's an EDLP. Uh, I show up and I get the deal. Uh, EDLP, there's the bonus pack there. I, I'll buy that. Uh, there's a large size or there's private label. So that active versus passive, and both are down year over year. Uh, and just because there's more of them, active tends, and actually in general active, besides EDLP, active tends to be more um, embraced in consumables. So, so Kurt, uh, yeah. so Kurt, we're looking at this data and we're, we're, we're crunching a lot here. We're, we're absorbing a lot and asking them. So. What's your take? Uh, there's more cherry picking, and what do you think this behavior does to standard loyalty programs? I, we'll talk about that much more toward the end, but I mean, it, the couple things that I will say is maybe top line is first of all, I've and I've maintained this that loyalty card is somewhat misused. People that use loyalty cards are really some of the most disloyal consumers out there. Um, what they are are very heavy users. Um, and I, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that these programs can have value, but you really need to rethink what that value is. And the value is to appeal to deal-sensitive shoppers, not so much to build loyalty. Because as we'll see in a few more slides, it's really kind of there's a high cause and effect between the more deals there are, the more shopping that occurs. But it certainly, I mean, it has major implications on how loyalty cards and uh, those programs are developed and utilized. Now let's go to the, some of the outlet um, 
data. Um, so what we're looking at here is then just the feedback year over year, percent of responses making a purchase at an outlet regularly. And again, remember, we're defining that as six plus times, at least six times a year. Now, keep in mind, the typical grocer gets about 25 trips per year, uh, at least based on some of the syndicated panel. Um, and so six isn't a real high threshold, but it is a, you know, once every other month. So it is regular. Um, but if you look, you see the traditional channels, grocery, Walmart, uh, at the top. But there's this very interesting shift, and it's, you know, and we've kind of been seeing a bigger interest in, say, dollar stores and some of these smaller format channels in general, drug, value, and C-store, all picking up. I also found it interesting, the, uh, and remember, we're just talking consumables here, but the definite uh, significant decline with the club stores. Both Sam's and Costco had a, um, a lower reported uh, purchase levels. Now, what we're going to do now is create a measure that we'll, we call share of mentions. And to do that, we're going to sum up all the responses for all the channels. So, so if I sum up all these numbers in green, and then for any given retailer, I use that as the numerator. So say Walmart, I add up all the numbers, and then 63 for Walmart. What that calculates is what we call a share of mentions, and what we found is that number correlates very highly to share of occasions. And again, I would encourage you to go back to some of the webinars that we've done to show the actual proof in that. Now, also note from what I said earlier, because we didn't have specific breakout for grocers, we'll see that share be somewhat understated. But in general, if you looked at syndicated panel data for a lot of these consumables categories and other sources, uh, you'd see pretty darn close Walmart's share of consumables is about 21%. Um, but what we also, though, see is that it really is traditional channels still are where, and if you look at some of these kind of where there's a lot of things written about, say, C store, or I'm not sorry, C stores online and natural foods, we're still only talking 5% of the category. Uh, category sales and in online it's actually only it's actually decreased slightly so our projected uh, share for uh, online in consumables is 1.3 percent so I mean it's really at this point not a factor so looking at it Kurt we used to attribute this type of shopping behavior to what we call the time-starved shopper do you now see deal activity as the primary driver? Uh, well, that's a great segue as we get further on, but there's actually four factors that we can point to. One will be, we'll show in our data, but there's the time starved. There's just the you know, sheer number of floor space dedicated to this format. So we've seen the growth in dollar store doors and um, the major drug chains uh, and C stores to a lesser extent. And then third of all, and I've seen some research in other sources that kind of uh, point to this, is the aging population. So as consumers get older, they don't want to deal with you know, the, the complexity and the hassle of real large big box stores. And so, you know, there's a more com higher comfort level uh, with the smaller format. But then that fourth factor is, is exactly what you point to, and we'll see some very clear evidence that deal activity has a much bigger role in that shift than you might think. And we're going to set that discussion up by going back to those two tools we talked about earlier, passive and active deal search. And again, I'm not going to get into the proof because it's in, I did that in prior webinars on proving that it is not cause, uh, correlation but causation of more deal activity causes higher sales. So what we're looking at here is the lowest level of passive deal tactic users and active and the highest. So there is a huge spread between high, deal, high passive and the low passive. So they're indexing. So they're the average uh, person that uses three or four passive deal tactics generates 26% more purchase occasions uh, than the average. 
and the ones that use only zero or one are 17 percent below so you see a very big spread i mean we always talk about let's target heavy users well the heavy users are the heavy deal activity people and we see it on both passive and active and then as we aggregate the two this is just total deals regardless of passive or active and we're looking at year over year so there's a 70 percent spread here between the heaviest and the lightest deal users so that i mean that's a major major difference and something that has meaning to the way you target customers i mean so not everybody wants deals but we certainly showed that 42 percent of them use five deals or more so it's kind of this fundamental need but this is what's really interesting so if we lock in the number of deals so the defined definition of heavy medium and light stays static year over year you can see that there's a slight decline in the number of heavy deal purchase users but an increase a meaningful increase in the uh, percent of purchases they make conversely you see these and I'm going to call them discouraged deal users that went up quite a bit 41 percent of the total to 44 percent and their purchase levels went down by five so there's two key areas. Remember, one of the objectives of this discussion was why is the category soft, um, and then how does deals work into that? Well, why is it soft? Well, we identified female millennials is one area, and then less compelling deals is another. Um, and again, this doesn't say that this isn't proof of the less compelling deals. This is corroboration from prior research that has been presented by the TABS group in previous webinars. So whose are these heavy deal buyers? Who comprises this 19 or 18 percent of the total population doing a disproportionate amount of purchasing? And it's the heavy deal buyers, as you would expect, are the people buying the most as well. So females between 35 to 64 and this is percent so you can see the average at 18 so they're up in 25 percent or more of those of that group is in it uh, you can see the heavy households the five plus members or more are also very high um, and then you can see also uh, the households with kids very high and then I found this very interesting and is there was a big regional split so in the southeast where there's this confluence and really the south in general a confluence between you know very prominent walmart presence club actually has a fairly big president presence more in florida Publix is a very strong and successful high low operator there's kroger that has a big presence so we're seeing a very high percentage of the, of the people the shoppers in this area very high deal level usage and then the people in kind of middle america which is west central which is texas oklahoma arkansas and louisiana and then the plains low deal usage and i would attribute this majorly primarily to a function of lower penetration of just chain stores in general it tends to be wholesalers and as those of you who've been in the industry a while know that a lot of these deals that get uh uh, presented really get watered down once it has to go through a wholesaler into the uh, the end buyer group and that's been an issue forever and something that's never really been adequately resolved so then let's look at now these groups active versus passive and how does that affect their outlet choices so we're looking at the same type of data what percent of these groups active one two and three buy at certain outlets notice first of all that the average number of outlets they purchase at went up quite a bit for all three groups so that that's that kind of people that are agreeing they shop more and they actually report quite a bit more cross-channel purchasing so not only are they not getting more loyal they're getting less loyal uh, and at, just as the level of loyalty programs has really increased quite a bit um, then we do that share of mentions that I spoke of um, and we have quite a significant decline in Walmart share among the more active the people that are falling in the active twos and active threes so the people that aren't engaged all that much in the active deal tactics Walmart has a 24 percent share but that goes down to 19 for the middle group and an 18 
for the passive group. Who gains? Well, it's the drug chains that have always had a core strategy of high-low. They're gaining among the more active deal shoppers. And then another one that kind of uh, loses is natural foods. So they really, I mean, we're talking Whole Foods, Sprouts, Trader Joe's, et cetera, uh, without a real strong, incredible um, promotional strategy, you can see that their share dips quite a bit. Uh, one thing I did found, find very interesting, this natural food really is kind of, and it's not shown on the slide, but it's this very upscale uh, uh, dynamic. So the share, the, their share, natural food share among those making 150,000 or more, is a nine. Uh, for everybody else, it's about three and a half. Um, so there really does. I mean, for the natural food to be mainstream, they have to get a credible promotional strategy, and they really have to expand their reach beyond just the very upscale. So we're looking at this chart, and and we we've discussed it. Um, can I infer? from this chart that if Walmart, as an example, started offering more traditional high-low promotions, that they would capture a higher share of the active two and three groups? Well, certainly the active twos. Um, and let me go back and just show you why that is. So see um, right here, so Walmart's penetration goes from 59 to 60 and jumps up to 73. You could argue that they're somewhat saturated. There's not a lot more upside among those highest. It's just their share is low because everybody else is kind of grabbing a piece of that as well. But certainly here, um, there's definitely a case to be made that they would get a higher share, a higher penetration thus higher share among those active twos by having some kind of credible high-low. It doesn't have to be at the same levels as some of their competitors. And based on this data, it appears that the consumers really make that uh, distinction between everyday price and promotional price. So I think probably, I, if I had to get into their heads, Walmart may you know, think that it's somewhat deceptive to you know, offer prices lower than their everyday price. But certainly from this information, I read it to mean that these buyers are going to Walmart at high levels. 60% of them still purchase at Walmart. It's just that they're allocating more of their purchases to other places where they can get the deals. Sure. sure. Okay, so then uh, the passive really is kind of the same story. I'm going to jump ahead, but uh, we see that same thing. And here's kind of, again, corroboration. So the people that just aren't engaged in deals at all, these passive ones, they didn't get more frenetic in their cross-channel purchasing. They were flat. These other two went up double digits. And so here this affects the ch uh, shares a bit differently. So you see passive. So here is where, and grocery is really not known for EDLP. There's a few that are, but primarily it's a high-low or a hybrid type of channel. You see their shares going down quite a bit. Uh, who gains? Well, dollar stores, which is the new emerging channel for getting you know, those EDLP-type shoppers, and actually found all those passive tactics worked uh, fairly well. And then Sam's actually picked up quite a bit. Walmart which is known for and made a name for themselves with EDLP, pretty much holds their share flat among all those groups. So, and that kind of provides further proof to your earlier point, Mike, on if they offered more deals, would their share go higher? And the answer is yes, because here you see in consumers that don't really care too much about active deals, uh, their share pretty much stayed the same. So, um, let, what can we infer from all this? What is, what's it all mean? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, laying some of the, much of the weakness at the feet of uh, millennials, and that's consistent with several of the macro trends on uh, higher unemployment, delayed marriage, living at home. But primarily, it's the substitution effect from consumption of food and beverage into tech and entertainment. The households with kids and the females 30, 35 to 54 are now and have always been the lifeblood of this industry. They are the core shopper. They buy the most uh, and deserve the most attention. 
when it talks about deals, I, what I'm uh, suggesting is that we really kind of analyze every paradigm and belief we hold about deals, that they're bad, that we're trading, that we're mortgaging the future and all the uh, cliches and the, the metaphors on drug use and get off the needle and all that stuff. Get rid of it. Not only can our consumers not train to buy on deal, deals are a fundamental, irreplaceable need of most shoppers. We saw 92% of them. So it's just as important or almost as important as variety seeking or a clean store or a convenient location. On that hierarchy of needs, it's right up there. It's right up there in explaining some of their outlet purchasing behavior. Also, the other flawed paradigm, deal purchasing, uh, it doesn't, it's just, you know, trading out consumers from everyday goods. That, again, is false. It leads to more, not less of the same, more purchasing, much more. And then loyalty is really an illusory concept, particularly with respect. We really should probably be talking about rewards programs, and, you know, this isn't a way to uh, engender more loyalty. It is a way to engender more purchasing um, and a higher, perhaps a higher share of sales within that outlet, um, because what we see is that loyalty is actually decreasing, not increasing across the industry for these categories. Um, and it's not the higher quantity that's hurting sales. The trade promotion is to blame for some of the industry weakness, but it's not a quantity issue. It's a quality issue. And the, w w when you're selling and lower discounts, consumers, a sizable percentage of them, become discouraged and will stop shopping in a particular outlet. And what can we infer by uh, outlet shopping behavior uh, and patterns? Well, there's a clear shift to smaller formats, and as you've made the, the inference, my deal activity does appear to be a contributor in that shift because recall that Dollar Channel picked up among heavy passive deal shoppers Drug Channel picked up among the actives, so it's consistent with their current promotional strategies, and so that's where the flow is going. So each of them are appealing to a different segment of deal shoppers and getting disproportionate shares from them. Deal activity does explain other retailer trends. First of all, uh, you know, another issue you raised, Mike, EDLP strategy does appear to be inhibiting Walmart's share among those active deal shoppers. The lack of EDLP or some kind of credible hybrid strategy would be inhibiting grocers. And if we look at two of the most successful grocers, at least as far as promotionally, uh, it would be Publix and ShopRite as far as kind of quality of promotion and solid baseline sales. That's not to say that they're always profitable, and there's a lot, probably a lot of snickers going on here. I'm not making any claims about that, but at least as far as who delivers the most compelling sales and strong growth and uh, disproportionate shares, those are the two retailers that really are best in class. And then similarly, I would infer natural foods would continue to struggle unless they have an answer on appealing to those heavy deal shoppers. Um, and then also I would say that the online uh, the obsession in this category in consumables is overblown. And don't just peg me from some stuffy traditionalist. I mean, I've been tracking vitamins for seven years, and I've seen online through our survey research grow by double digits every year. So it, there are pockets where it's growing very dynamically within the CPG industry. It's just consumables is not one of them. I saw some breathless tweet out there saying, oh, grocery expected to quadruple over the next 10 years. Okay, great. That's a five share in 10 years. But the amount of effort going toward it was more than 5% of the effort, it would appear. So what do I recommend? First of all, embrace the fact that consumers will always want uh, and need deals, and so that active and passive deals really have a role in any type of strategy. And that's really then let's establish a promotional strategy that is quality versus quantity. There is never an instance where quantity trumps quality, and I know that's always a, uh, a question. All of the, the people, the companies that we talk to, retailers, manufacturers, should we go for more quantity or you know, more events or deeper events? And the deeper is always better than uh, quantity. Include 
and this is very consistent, straightforward, aggressive promotional discount is part of that strategy. So the weak, less compelling offers, you can do it. And there's actually ROI uh, occasions where that makes sense for smaller brands, certainly not some of the big blockbusters consumables brands. Um, if you're only going to go to the passive side of your deal strategy, EDLP, bonus packs, you're going to limit your upside. Active and aggressive active deals need to be a part of that strategy. Uh, and one of the uh, recommendations for uh, where rewards comes in is it's really a strong overlay into those special consumers. So don't exclude it. Let everybody participate in deals and then offer your special customers, your card holders, that extra special deal. Accept that those loyalty card programs really don't build loyalty, but acknowledge that they do have a very uh, uh, solid role in any promotional strategy. And they can be effective, they can be profitable, they just shouldn't be and aren't the most important component of a promotional strategy. But many of the drug chains in particular are making it so to the exclusion of other uh, promotional tactics. And just suppress your inclinations to becoming an aspiring futurist. I mean, online is a non-factor. Millennials are declining and female millennials and relatively less important. I wouldn't say unimportant. That's maybe an overstatement. And then the old school deal tactics still outperforming new school. So Sunday circulars and FSIs are still better than uh, rewards programs and uh, online coupons. So focus on what matters right now, and that's mass market retailing, that's broad reach media, that's households with kids, that's females 35 to 54, and that is focused, compelling promotionals to your shoppers. It doesn't have to get any more complicated or divided than that. So with that, I thank everyone for their attention, and I'll turn it back to Mike. Kurt, thank you. It is compelling research, and these are data points that we have to take a hard look at as we start to look at it as manufacturers, as retailers. I want to turn it over to Jim and get into our Q&A. Thanks very much, both Mike and Kurt, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, next, as Mike said, we'll be beginning the Q&A portion of the webcast. But first, I'd like to remind you of a couple of things. In a little bit, you're going to see a webcast evaluation survey on your screen. We'd like you to fill that out. We really appreciate your feedback, and uh, Stagnito will use it to plan its future webcasts. Remember, if you haven't done so already, please turn off your pop-up blocker so you'll be able to see the survey. Uh, also, if we run out of time before getting to your questions, one of the presenters will get back to you privately with a response. Now we'll begin the Q&A. Our first question is do we know what category shoppers are buying the most of at dollar stores? This research didn't address that specifically. Uh, what we can infer um, just by some of the cross-referencing we would do is that um, the categories that in general consumers are buying the most of, salty snacks and uh, car bev and water, are the ones dollar stores are uh, you know, doing the most at dollar stores as well. And in fact, that was actually uh, talked about um, in the latest Dollar General quarterly report where they laid a lot of their growth at uh, the growth in uh, consumables, and they talked about those categories in particular being particularly strong and large. Very good. Our next question is, where does buy online but pick up in store fall in your sales channels? Is it considered online or is it considered grocery? Um, it would be online because we, um, the way we articulated the question would be where do you purchase your products, um, you know, where do you do your shopping? Um, and, to be fair, we probably would want to clarify that a bit more as that gets a bit higher penetration. But at this point, I mean, you know, that, so we're giving it uh, the benefit of the doubt that it's all going uh, to online. But uh, and that's what I'm inferring just by based on some of the feedback from the research. Okay. Our next question: How much of the growth in the drug channel? is coming from millennials who live in urban areas and that use that channel primarily? Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, we certainly have the data to look at that. I did not look at that specifically. Um, growth in general in the drug channel skews older. I mean, that's a channel that skews older anyway. Um, and as you point out, um, that it's an urban uh, dynamic. Now, um, as you also saw that millennials, female millennials is declining. So I'd be very shocked if it's even flat among female millennials drug chain purchasing, but we would have to go back and look at that. If you want to send me an email uh, or whatever, I can uh, get that for you and send you off the information. And that's Kurt Jetta, K-U-R-T-J-E-T-T-A at tabsgroup.com. Great. Thanks very much, Kurt. Uh, our next question comes from a listener uh, who's asking if you could please define what shop for deals means. And uh, she says she considers circulars, FSIs, et cetera, as the source of deals. Yeah, so they are they shop at various retailers. So they are going um, – from retailer to retailer, so it was specifically defined. I go to various uh, outlets that have the best deals. It was uh, I don't have the specific uh, wording, but there was a comment about uh, really shopping at a sp particular outlet that has the best deals. So it's explicitly getting to the fact that they're bouncing from store to store to find deals. And that could be any one of the other tactics. So there would be kind of a... Um, dual kind of response on that type of behavior. Great. Our next question is, where do TPRs fall in the deal tactics hierarchy? Are they an active tactic or a passive tactic? It's a good question, and we didn't ask it, and we need to ask it. Um, I would infer, um, and we actually will kind of make that final determination based on where the data takes us. And so we could look at kind of the, you know, whether there are outlet purchasing patterns that align more to passive or active. I would infer that it would be passive because I don't really see that TPR, uh, that offer until I actually get to the shelf. I didn't really have to alter my behavior or go out of my way because once that communication vehicle outside of the shelf would be that circular. So at this point, that's why I infer, but it's, uh, you know, for this survey, it was not explicitly asked. Our next question. Uh, how do we capture pre-trip planning online at retailer sites? Uh, perhaps that is that part of the look for deals response? That's another one we're definitely going to ask. Somebody had a great idea, you know, really kind of shop for deals online. Um, you know, at, at this point, uh, again, we didn't ask it. Um, you know, but our research of very low online activity corroborates actually just something I saw from Willard Bishop. I think they pegged it at like 1.8 percent. So I mean, you know, we're very confident in the. the but it's somewhat at this point. It's you know, not to totally dismiss the question because we're definitely going to ask it next year. But at, you know, within the overall context of the research, it's not as meaningful or relevant as some of the other things. But uh, next year, tune in next year, and we will have a, a def definite answer for that. What are the implications for loyalty cards as a deal tactic based on your research results? Uh, the implications are, and one of the biggest limitations of these now is their exclusionary nature, meaning that if you don't have the card, you can't get the deal, and you're implicitly being told you're not wanted. Um, and so to that that's the first implication is that deals, uh, there should be a, most of the deal should be offered to everybody. And then to appeal to those very heavy deal shoppers, particularly the active ones, that's where you layer on uh, through your rewards card program some even more compelling deals, whether it's more points, it's deeper promotions, whatever. But, uh, you know, there's a whole other host of issues that are really inhibiting uh, loyalty card impact, but I would uh, identify, and this research really corroborated the fact that it's the exclusionary nature, because if you remember, the percent change on loyalty cards was 
uh, at the high end of decrease uh, of all the various tactics. I'll add to that in that it's got to be rewards, and it's got to be more than just pushed out to the masses. As we're utilizing more data, as we're getting more feedback from our customers and we're able to capture this and utilize it in planning, it's going to be the personal one-to-one offers that will make the difference there. Yep. Great. Uh, Is there a mix of so-called old-school tactics that you'd recommend for manufacturers to execute? Well, uh, I mean, not a kind of a cookie-cutter approach, but certainly the old-school would be um, circulars still are the predominant form of the way consumers go look for deals uh, with inactive. Um, EDLP is tough. I mean, certainly with EDLP retailers, you want to work with them, but truly I would not dump it all into promotion. I mean, I know Walmart, I, I'm, I'm sorry, not an into everyday price. I know Walmart says, hey, give it to us all in price, but to the extent that you can hold back and reallocate some of those funds to get – uh, at least even better, uh, some you know, invest in kind of a special promotion pack for them, buy two, get one free, something of that nature. Uh, that's not, um, that's kind of old school. Uh, the new school, I mean, loyalty, again, it's kind of an overlay. It should not be the predominant everything you do. I mean, we've seen some, uh, you know, budgets. Now, interestingly enough, you didn't see any b- retailers complaining. We looked. No retailers were complaining on their lack of profitability because of promotion. So, I mean, what these uh, rewards and digital coupon programs have done is you know, really affected a major swing in um, how who is subsidizing and paying for these deals, and it's really moves quite heavily onto the manufacturer. So, manufacturers are more often now covering. Uh, the entire discount to the consumer. They're um, having to layer on, you know, all these kind of two-dollar, three-dollar rewards, mix and match, all this other stuff. Uh, and it, that stuff is just not moving the needle like the old school tactics. All right, our next question. Uh, could you review the definitions of active versus passive, and how heavy, medium, and light were defined for each? Active um, active deal is anything that um, any type of promotion where the consumer has to actively engage. And I'm thinking about maybe redefining that because active, maybe, maybe it's engaged or something. Explicit. You have to do something. You have to, I have to cut out a coupon. I have to search the circular. I have to go from store to store to get the best deal. Passive is the only thing required of me is I show up at the shelf. Whether I know there's a deal or not, I get the deal just by seeing it on the shelf. So there's an everyday low price. There is a bonus pack right in front of me. So the question might be, well, how do you know that's even appropriate? Well, it's appropriate because it helps us explain the trends that we see. It provides... um, it, it predicts and explains what's going on in the market, and that's how I know that it's appropriate, uh, an appropriate discussion or a definition. Um, and that's why I won't explicitly define TPR until we say, well, what is the data telling us? How is the consumer reacting? Are they reacting passively and altering their deal uh, outlet decisions similar to other passive tactics, or is it more like active? Any other questions? Great. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this one's specifically for Kurt. Do you have studies on personal care? Uh, this, uh, this questioner asks, uh, I suspect the buyer looks at these categories in a less commodity point of view, uh, and that should, if this, quest- if this uh, participant's assumptions are correct, affect the de- deal influence. They're looking for studies. Um, so I would encourage you to get on webinars.tabsgroup.com. We asked about OTC, which is analgesics, cough, cold, vitamins. It was done in, I think it was April 2013, so it definitely needs to be op- uh, updated. There were a couple key differences between that and uh, consum- uh, consumables. Active deal tactics were much more important. 
than they are in consumables. So they clearly had a predominant effect on category purchasing behavior uh, versus passive deal tactics. Um, not sure. I'd have to think a little bit on how the, the whole premise of less commoditization. I think that does play into that, but I'm not sure. I have to think about that a little bit more. But uh, yeah, that, that one's a half hour, so not as much, not as lengthy as this one, so you can see how OTC is different than this. All right. Well, there are a few more questions in the hopper, but that takes us right up to the end of our time. So anyone who didn't get your questions answered, uh, we will attempt to reach out to you and answer them personally. Uh, so uh, that is all we have time for today. Before we conclude, uh, please remember to fill out your evaluation surveys. We really do want your feedback. Uh, that just leaves me to say thank you to today's guests, Michael Cantor and Kurt Jetta, and thank you to everyone out there who joined us today. This ends today's webcast. For Progressive Grocer and Stagnito Business Information, I'm Jim Dutlasek. Have a great day.